prophets dealt with, which was corruption. The people had lost their integrity, and they were also oppressing the poor and the needy. And often, God is calling to them, take up the cause of the fatherless and the widow and the poor to treat them justly and with integrity. The nation had not only neglected God by idol worship, but they were neglecting each other through corruption and through oppression. And God is to the point here in Isaiah's ministry where although judgment has not come in the form of exile yet, God is saying exile is coming. Meaning Israel and Judah are going to be taken out of their land. They're going to be made slaves like they were in Egypt. And, and terrible things are coming. And so it can be kind of discouraging to read some of these prophecies where it's doom and gloom of judgment. And yet, if you're reading carefully, in the midst of the judgment and the doom and the gloom and, and the discouragement of Israel's failure, you see little glimmers of hope. Little glimmers of hope. Look with me at verse 13. Let's read it again. Chapter 6, verse 13. It says, but yet in it shall be a tenth, and in it shall return and shall be eaten as a tail tree and as an oak whose substance is in them. When they cast their leaves, so the holy seed shall be the substance thereof. We see, and I'm going to explain what this means to the best of my ability tonight. But we see in verse 13, in the midst of prophesying great judgment in verses 10 through 12, we see a glimmer of hope. And that glimmer of hope is that God is still going to fulfill his promise. Even though he's going to judge the nations, he's still going to bring blessings. So tonight, if you're taking notes, I want to meditate on verse 13. And I want us to see three reminders from God's remnant prophecy. Three reminders from God's remnant prophecy. I want you to see number one tonight. God always fulfills his promises. God always fulfills his promises. In this section, God is promising that Israel and Judah would suffer great loss and endure exile. They would be taken out of their lands. They would be forced to serve as slaves again, like they were in Egypt. They, their prosperous and fertile promised land that God gave them would be desolate and would be handed over to the other nations around them. And if, just to remind you in your reading, it's not like God just woke up on the wrong side of the bed. God warned them way ahead of time. If you forsake my word, if you do these things, I will push you out of the land. And so God here is, is judging them with something he had already warned the nation about. They had fair instruction. They had fair warning. And despite his gracious warning, they chose to sin and they had to suffer the consequences. And so what's going on here in, in this verse is he's talking about the land here is going to be desolate. Look again at verse 13. He says, but yet in it shall be a tenth and it shall return. This is God talking about a remnant of Israel. In all of the exiles, of course, we're not going to do an entire Old Testament survey because we're still going to get to some of that. But in the exiles, in all the exiles, some people were left in Israel. And also, in both exiles, people returned. Remember? Ezra and Nehemiah and building the walls and rebuilding the temple. In, in all of the exiles, people came back. But if you were to look at the situation, the land was really destroyed. And remember, I think the symbol of God's prosperity is what? The temple, right? Solomon's temple that stood as a testimony of God's greatness and blessing to Israel was stripped and destroyed completely. And what he's saying here in verse 13 is there's going to be great destruction in verse 12. And yet in all that judgment, there'll be a remnant. And he says, and it shall return and shall be eaten. What? Even the remnant is going to suffer destruction and loss. 
the situation is going to look terrible. And yet, as an oak whose substance is in them, when they cast their leaves, so the holy seed shall be the substance thereof. We're going to get into that in detail in a minute. But I want us to understand that the reality of this remnant and the reality of what God would do through Israel is a reminder to us tonight that no matter what chaos is going on around us, God always fulfills his promises. God had made promises first to Abraham, then to Isaac, then to Jacob, then to David, and said, I'm going to do great things. One of the main promises is, through you, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. But God gave, and you were reading them in the Old Testament, lots and lots of specific promises to Israel. And it's through this remnant that God is going to fulfill all his promises and bring about a holy seed. I'm so thankful tonight that God always fulfills his promises. Even when man fails, Israel failed here. They utterly failed. And yet God still brought about and fulfilled his promises. There are so many promises in God's word for you and me that we can cling to tonight. Let me just encourage you, when you're struggling, cling to those promises. I love where he tells his disciples, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will what? Come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. Jesus says to his disciples, don't despair that I'm leaving. We are going to be together. That is a promise for God's children, that we are going to dwell with God. No matter what's going on on this earth, no matter what happens with America, no matter what happens in your personal ambitions and your life, we are going to be with our Savior in eternity. Praise the Lord for that. God has promised in his word that he will never leave us nor forsake us. It doesn't matter how bad things get, God is walking through our suffering, through our difficulty with us. God has promised that he's going to make us new and give us glorified bodies. I don't know about you, but I'm excited for that. I'm excited to have a body. You know, I don't want to complain because I'm still young, but I'm at that age where I wake up and there's new pain and my back hurts and my, and I'm not as young anymore. Misty says to me all the time, she says, we're not spring chickens anymore. And so our joke is we're just chickens now. We're not spring chickens, we're just chickens so, but I'm, I'm not complaining. I'm still young and I'm thankful for my health, but I'm starting to feel the decline of this body. And a lot of it's my own fault, but I'm starting to feel that decline. And I already look forward to the day where I can serve God in the eternal state with a glorified body. Not only a glorified body that doesn't have back and hip pain and, and ankle issues and all the other problems, but guess what? Has no sin nature. Man, we're going to get along good in heaven, aren't we? I mean, we get along pretty good down here, but all these little annoyances, and co- they're not going to be there. We're going to be changed. That's God's promises from his word. God has promised he's coming again. He's promised that we'll have, he will have victory over all evil and make all things new. God has promised us in, in his word that no matter what happens in this life, nothing can separate us from his love. God has promised us that he will take care of his children, that he will give us wisdom if we ask for it. I love when Jesus says, I know every hair on your head. He says, not a sparrow falls without God knowing. If God takes care of the lilies of the field, how much more will he clothe you and me, O ye of little faith? God is going to take care of us. He's promised that. Christian, we don't have to stress about our basic needs. We are guaranteed our heavenly father is going to take care of us. So many more. We could go on and on and on. But Christian, God's word is full of promises. And what we can look in the past, there's a saying, it's kind of a business saying, is, let me, I don't want to slaughter it. Sorry, let me get it in my head. Past performance predicts future outcomes. Is that right? Does that sound something like that? Have you heard that in the business world? The best way to predict the future is past performance. Well, let me tell you something. Our God has proven himself in the past that he's faithful, that he fulfills his promises. And in this passage, we see Israel under great judgment. Of course, they're not yet, but prophesied great judgment. 
where things look really bad. And God says, there's a remnant and there's a holy seed. And through that, I'm going to fulfill my promises. Church, God always fulfills his promises. Let's look at number two we're going to see tonight. Number two, with God, there is still hope even when things look hopeless or look dead. Look at, look at verse 13 again. He says, As a tail tree or as an oak whose substance is in them, when they cast their leaves, so the holy seed shall be the substance thereof. There's a little bit of debate on exactly what this means. There's two possible illustrations. They have the same meaning, but there's two possible illustrations. The one idea is one where a tree is dead, but it's cast its seed. Let's use an oak tree. What, what is an oak tree seed? Anybody know? Acorns. Good. I, I knew my hunters would know that. We're always looking for acorns, right? White oaks, red oaks. White oaks are deer's favorite, so we look for white oaks. But as the tree dies, those acorns is the holy seed there that extends life, that continues the life, that grows a new plant. There's another position here that this is actually talking about when a tree is cut down. Have you ever seen a stump sprout? It can be really annoying if you're trying to get rid of the tree, right? You cut the tree down and some trees, not all, but some trees, there's just a stump there. They look dead. It's over. It's Game over, the tree's dead, and yet then what happens? A shoot comes up out of that tree. I don't know which one exactly this is referring to. It's not full, fully clear. But either way, here's the imagery. Things look dead and hopeless. From the outside observer, those that look at Israel would say it's over for them. There's nothing good can happen here. And God is saying, and yet hidden in that is a holy seed. There is hope in this little remnant of Jews. There is hope for the future. With our God, there is still hope even when things look dead or hopeless. I think sometimes as Christians, we are guilty of not having faith in certain circumstances in our lives that look hopeless to us. There are people in our lives that we feel we would never, maybe wouldn't utter it, you wouldn't admit it here in church tonight on a Sunday night, but if you were honest, your heart feels that that situation is hopeless. Maybe it's a relationship that's strained. Maybe it's a person that's rejecting the gospel. Maybe it's a situation that is so convoluted and so much baggage and sin and so much stress and, and so much chaos that you say nothing can good can come from that. And I just want to challenge us this evening to be people of faith as Christians that look at a situation, no matter how bad it looks, and says God can still work in this situation. No person is so far gone that God cannot forgive them and save them. No relationship is so hurt that God cannot mend it. No situation is so bad that God cannot bring good from it. When it looks like all is lost, God can still work. I want you to imagine being in Daniel's day. Israel is in exile. Judah is in exile. All, there, there's chaos all across the land. The land is desolate. Imagine Daniel talking to someone and saying, oh yeah, Israel's going to be a great nation that's going to rule the world and uh, God's going to send his Messiah King and everything's going to be wonderful. And uh, here he is as a slave in a foreign land. People would have laughed. They would have said, Israel is decimated, scattered. The land is desolate. It's inhabited by others. They would have said, this is a hopeless situation. But it was not hopeless because God had a plan that he was going to bring to pass. As Christians now, we look at our Old Testament and we say, wow. We can look back on this and say, wow. Even when things got so bad, even when there was so much sin among God's people. I think often we get discouraged, don't we, with Christians. I mean, I encourage you a lot. Don't be frustrated that the world acts like the world. But sometimes it gets discouraging when God's children are not acting like God's children. 
Does that ever bother you? It bothers me. It bothers me when I hear things about Christians that should know better, that should be living more Christ-like, churches that are doing things that are an abomination to God. That bothers us, and that can get us very discouraged. But here we see God's people in utter failure, and it does not stop God's plan from going forward. Even before 1947, people would look and say, there's no way that God still has a plan for Israel. They're scattered all over the world. And yet God, what? He miraculously brought the, brought the nation of Israel back to the land. There's no situation that is so bad that God cannot work it in it and through it. Even when sin has brought judgment, even as a Christian, when you have caused, when you has stuck your foot in your mouth when you've stepped in it, when you've caused the problems. And yes, you have to live with the consequences. Did not Israel have to live with the consequences here? They absolutely did. And yet God still worked. He still used them, and he still fulfilled his promises and his plans. Church, we as Christians need to have eyes of faith where we can look at terrible situations and we can believe that God can still work and still do great things. In every one of our lives, there's a situation that looks like a dead tree, that looks like a stump just sitting there, rotten, hopeless. And I would challenge us that God can still work in those hopeless situations. Let's look at number three tonight. Number three, Jesus brought hope to all people. Look at verse 13 again. So the holy seed shall be the substance thereof. That remnant that God allowed back in the land that suffered, that was just a small percentage of the glory of the nation of Israel, that remnant is what God used through generations to bring about Jesus Christ, who was the holy seed that brought hope to all people. The promise to Abraham that all the nations of the earth would be blessed was answered in the person and work of Jesus Christ. He came here as the Jews' Messiah. He sacrificed himself for the sins of the world, and he offers salvation to every person in the world who will believe. He was the one the Jews looked forward to. He was the perfect prophet, the perfect priest, the perfect king that they desired and that they needed. Through salvation and through the New Testament church, Christ has blessed every nation on the earth. Despite Israel's sin, God gave them a Messiah. Despite their resistance, God fulfilled many of his promises. Now, when I read my Old Testament, I see a lot of promises that were fulfilled in Christ. But I also see a lot of promises that haven't been fulfilled yet. And I believe that those things will be fulfilled in Christ's second coming. It says in there, there are physical boundaries that Israel is going to reign over that they have never reigned over. And some people say, oh, that was fulfilled in Jesus' first coming. That was fulfilled spiritually. I don't buy it. I don't buy it. I believe every promise that God promised to Israel will be fulfilled. Many of them already have, and the rest of them will be fulfilled when Jesus comes back. Jesus is proof of God's power and his faithfulness to his people. Jesus, that see, holy seed in that remnant, was Jesus. If you want a little evidence to the language here, flip over in your Bible, and I don't mean to do any spoiler alerts, but let's flip over and read a little bit of Isaiah 53 tonight before we get into the Lord's Supper. Turn in your Bible to Isaiah 53. Remember, what language did, did we just read about? A holy seed in a stump, right? A dead tree, but a holy seed. Look at Isaiah 53. Who hath believed our report, and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of dry ground. 
He hath no form nor comeliness. And when they shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of man, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquity. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed. There's our hope, folks. There's the hope to the whole world. There's the hope for Israel. The hope for you. The hope for me is right there in what Jesus did on the cross. And notice the language back there in verse 2. For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, as a root out of dry ground. Isn't that what we were reading here? In a desolate land, amidst judgment and chaos, God fulfilled his promise. He brought hope to the whole world and the nation of Israel through his son, Jesus Christ. He was the holy seed that remained through the remnant, came forth as a babe in a manger, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In a few minutes, we're going to partake in the Lord's Supper. And as we meditate on what Christ endured on the cross. I want you to also meditate on this fact tonight that we can rejoice in, that Jesus brings us hope. I hope, I hope you're filled with hope tonight. We are surrounded by, with a world of people that have no hope. They believe that this life is about their own pleasures and they're going to die and just cease to exist. They have no hope for eternity. They have no hope for the future. But a relationship with Christ brings us hope. As we meditate on the cross tonight, let's think about that hope. And let's also think about this. That Jesus is the fulfillment of God's promise long ago to bless all nations through Israel. And so when we meditate on Christ and the cross, let's also worship God the Father tonight for his faithfulness and his power that he will fulfill every word he's promised and that he'll bring his plan to pass no matter what happens in this world. Christ gives us that hope and reminds us that God is faithful. All these years earlier, Isaiah is getting this vision from God, and he's hearing about a holy seed. That's our Savior, Jesus Christ. So let's spend some time meditating on him, and let's thank God that he fulfills his promises. I'm so glad for that. You know, your pastor is going to fail you. Your spouse is going to fail you. This church is going to fail you in some way or the other. But Jesus Christ will never fail you. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you so much for this passage. Lord, when your people reject you, when there's chaos and judgment, when there's consequences, when there's convoluted, sinful issues, amidst all that, there is a seed of hope because of your plan. Lord, in in the midst of all of Israel's trials, they could have hope because of your promises, because of the Messiah that you would send in your son, Jesus. Lord, thank you for the hope we have tonight because of Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray tonight that you would help us to truly be thankful for that, to rejoice in that hope, and to meditate on the cost that it took so that we could have salvation. Lord, bless this time as we meditate on the cross. We ask this in your son's name. Amen.